This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. And by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today joined by uh, Guillaume Lebleu. He's uh, originally from France, but he's been living out in Silicon Valley for a long time. And it's been really interesting sort of preparing for the episode because he's actually been interested in the, in the sort of topic that Bitcoin brought up for, for a long time before Bitcoin he was also a very early Bitcoiner. And sort of most recently, and, and he was a CTO of Gift and he still works uh, for Gift, which was acquired now. So Guillaume, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I thought it was, was really fascinating reading your blog. So you've been quite a prolific blogger, written tons of posts. And, and uh, when I was looking at your blog, you know, you seem to write about a lot of the topics that people started to think about a lot when Bitcoin came up, right? Like what are currencies? How do they work? What's value? Uh, and, but, but before Bitcoin. So that's, that was very interesting to see that. So, so can you get a bit, a bit of a background about yourself and how your interests evolved, I guess. Yeah, so uh, I, I started to work in the financial technology sector in about 2004. I studied a company called Breaks Logic that was working with uh, large financial institutions, banks and insurance companies to help them implement uh, web services uh, around industry standards um, that were uh, popular at the time and moving the infrastructure of uh, banks and payments processors from uh, legacy protocols to more modern APIs. Uh, the idea was that we could build a kind of a banking layer that uh, people would be able to build uh, easily uh, new apps on top of. So, uh, and uh, this company was acquired by a, a, a large uh, company called Dbold that provides banking solutions to uh, financial institutions. Uh, and uh, after working there for a few years, uh, the financial crisis happened. And I just felt like this was a moment where they would give some legitimacy for innovation in financial services. Around the same time, uh, I think a lot of people in the industry had uh, similar thoughts. Uh, you know, Square started around the same time. Uh, Bitcoin emerged at the time. so. I, uh, I started to look at the, the, the part of, uh, that was interesting to me, which was how do we uh, actually uh, empower businesses, uh, anyone with some productive capacity to, uh, to participate in, uh, as a financial asset issuer. And so prepaid and uh, any sort of business issued credits to me was a, a very interesting place to, 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 to change how you know, the banking system and money works. So that's been really what I've been focusing on uh, since uh, 2010 through a variety of projects that uh, one of them being uh, Bernal Bucks, which was the first uh, uh, neighborhood currency uh, linked to a, uh, a debit card, and uh, as well as Credibles, which was a, a crowdfunding product uh, using prepaid, uh, uh, business issued prepaid for uh, companies to uh, small businesses, especially in the food segment to raise money. Why did you see uh, deb or prepaid as as such an interesting way to start? Because I mean, if you think of the like financial crisis and the way the banking system works, it's not obvious to me why that would be a good place to start changing how money works. Right. It, it's a it's a fair point. Uh, I think what I saw was that uh, essentially the banking system, you know, it it works uh, through credit, right? So. Uh, when credit expands, things go well. When credit goes down, things go bad. So, and the only way to actually uh, create credit into our system is uh, through bank loans. So when banks decide not to lend money, uh, we basically go into a, a negative uh, spiral loop. Uh, so 
giving the ability for businesses to issue their own prepaid assets would give them an ability to uh, to uh, 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 go against that, right? So it's something that uh, you know has been talked about for many years. Uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, people were talking about the IBM dollar, uh, and uh, you know, large brands like Starbucks, for instance, have been doing this for a while now. They are doing about one fourth of their global sales through prepaid. So the idea that you trust a brand uh, that is actually delivering products and services more than a bank, which is more like a collection, like a leverage between uh, debts and, and assets, uh, is uh, to me made sense. Uh, it's uh, it seems today that you know people do trust Starbucks with their money much more than they trust a lot of uh, smaller institutions. So. Um, that for me it was interesting. So there's another reason which is, makes this very interesting, is that it's actually uh, prepaid is actually a very simple asset, and uh, the fact that it's closed loop, uh, the regulations that are around it are fairly uh, simple, right? So since you're issuing an asset that can, can technically be only redeemed at the business we issued it, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it it doesn't doesn't really is considered as money by uh, regulators throughout the world. So it's uh, really easy to innovate around this. If you want to do uh, prepaid on the blockchain, it's much easier than if you want to do securities on the blockchain or bank deposits. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting place to experiment, innovate, deliver production-ready systems, and then look at other opportunities in other spaces. So I mean, the, the idea that uh, the business issued assets uh, space is sort of a closed loop uh, and not considered money. Do you, I mean, we can get the, into this topic a little deeper in the show, but do you think that that can change with the advent of cryptocurrency and the ability to exchange currencies uh, on exchange platforms? W will that evolve in the future? Yeah, of course. So, but today, you know, the way that regulations think about money is that it's either money or it's not money. So uh, I think things, uh, these regulations are gonna have to evolve to recognize that it's really about liquidity. So if you have an illiquid asset, and Bitcoin to a degree is somewhat, somewhat of an illiquid asset, still you cannot really sell a million dollars worth of Bitcoin without, without affecting the price. So the more liquid an asset is, the more likely it's gonna be used for um, you know, driving uh, maybe illegal transactions as well. So if you're trying to move longer money, you may not use gift card uh, because you're going to lose a lot on, fric on friction, on swapping. Uh, but if you're going to, uh, if you have an asset that you can transact a lot in it without losing too much in in uh, transaction costs and exchange costs, then it becomes a basically because money. So I see money as really as liquidity. Uh, any asset can function as money. It's really how liquid this asset is. So I think I think regulators will need to evolve to a point where they look at uh, how liquid a particular asset is and, uh, and, 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 as a, and, and regulate things based on that, not based on uh, whether it can be transferred peer to peer. Uh, let's uh, get into the, the gift card uh, market. Before we get into what you guys have built at Gift, um, can you talk to us about what the current gift card industry looks like and specifically the infrastructure that most of us don't realize that you know when we use a gift card, when we go into a store and buy a gift card and pay with it, that there's a like there's this very complex infrastructure underneath that, and multiple actors. Can you sort of give us an overview of what that looks like? Yeah. So uh, the uh, the gift card market as an industry is about a hundred billion, hundred I think thirty billion dollars uh, a year, uh, and uh, within that you have what's called open loop and, and, and closed loop. So I would say it's about half and half. Uh, one half is open loop, like your Visa card that you buy at Safeway to you know, put money on uh, if you're unbanked, or uh, and closed loop, which is merchant-specific uh, gift cards. Um, and the variety of use cases go way beyond like the typical gift card. I mean, gift card has, has stayed as the, uh, the main uh, term for, you know, basically merchant issued prepaid, uh, maybe because there's not not any other good uh, term for it. Uh, but really, the use case are uh, 
you know, for instance, buying for yourself, uh, uh, making a, a company doing a, 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 a buying a gift card for their as an incentive to their employees, uh, rewarding people for performing certain actions online or offline. Uh, so, for instance, you fill up a survey at a, at a grocery store, you get a gift card. So, there's a lot more use case to gift cards than just uh, you know someone sending a gift to someone else. Um, and the way the, comp the, 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 the market is structured is that uh, you have uh, a, a limited number of processors, which are your uh, you know, companies that authorize transactions on these gift cards. And then you have a number of players between these processors and the receiver of the gift card, the user of the gift card. And some of these processors are doing distribution or reselling or uh, so buying these gift cards from each other. Right, so there is a lot of uh, movement, and there's a lot of intermediaries, if you want, between uh, the processor and the end receiver of the gift card. And nowadays, you see even more more uh, players uh, appearing. For instance, you have uh, gift card exchange marketplace. So you could have, uh, you know, from the time the gift card number is issued and provisioned to the time it is consumed, you could have, you know, five six players. Uh, so. Uh, the, the security of the gift card is very similar to where you know credit cards were 20, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, today credit cards, debit cards have been uh, security models have been increasingly tightened. Uh, you know, with uh, you know tokenization, what Apple Pay is using, uh, it's uh, it's a pretty tight security model. But for gift card, we're still using st static gift card numbers. So as these gift card numbers get transferred. And as the gift card market gets digitized, so you're transferring not only you're no longer transferring a gift card with a max stripe and coded uh, card number, you're just sending a card number around. Uh, it's prone to being stolen and compromised. So, uh, and and I'm not even talking about uh, processors or companies that basically issue gift cards as you know sequential numbers, which uh, we've seen. Uh, the uh, you know, there is a lot of points in that chain where uh, this card number can get compromised. So, you know, the story a lot of people have heard about is people going to a retail store, scanning the gift card uh, number there, and then uh, look, you know, just writing scripts to check if the if the uh, the card has been activated and funds have been loaded on it. So, uh, I think the industry is spending a lot of time trying to work against these kind of uh, basic attacks. And so at Gift, we felt like you know this needs uh, kind of a a new model, right? And um, instead of using shared secrets that we are going to send to each other, uh, the blockchain model of using uh, you know uh, publicly encryption, publicly signed uh, transaction uh, is is a very uh, just that is a very useful uh, model for securing transactions. So that's. That's kind of where we started with, uh, with uh, our interest in, in, in Bitcoin as a platform and blockchain is how do we solve that security problem? So you, you mentioned the security issues uh, and specifically we're talking about card numbers getting stolen along the, along the, the chain uh, where, from where the card is produced to where it is consumed. What are some of the other pain points that we may encounter on the merchant side or on the consumer side with the way that the current Bitcoin market works, or the current uh, gift card market? Sorry. Yeah, so it's not easy for us to check uh, to check a balance on the card. So you have, uh, uh, you know, even for us, you know, gift. Uh, we have a lot of experience in the in the area. We uh, we are part of uh, First Data. We have access to a lot of, uh, uh, you know processors and a lot of players in the, in, the, in, the, in the space, it's still very difficult for us to, to provide, um, you know, up-to-date uh, balance information for these gift cards. Uh, every system is different. Uh, it's due to the nature of closed loop that since it was closed loop, everybody could kind of do whatever they wanted. So uh, we have today there, you know, maybe potentially for every if there are, let's say there's about 15, 20 different places where you can check the balance, so APIs to check balances of gift card, and uh, maybe not all the merchants 
uh, supported. So for each given merchant, you may have different, uh, you may be able to check the balance, but uh, not, uh, not uh, transfer for, to another card, for instance. Or, so there are different features that are not available for different merchants and different processors. So it makes things very complicated from an application developer standpoint, right? If you're just interested to start issuing these gift cards and allowing them to be redeemed where they, at the merchant where they are issued, it's just, uh, it's just very complicated. And you need to essentially uh, you know, pay all these players uh, along the chain for their, uh, you know, their services. Uh, I think it's very similar to the banking, the way the banking system works. Uh, Do you have any idea of how much it costs a merchant on t like for every dollar bi uh, gift card that is sold, how much overhead they're they're paying for like this whole system and the security and the the loss and all of this? No, I don't have specific numbers about that, but uh, um, the definitely, I mean, the, 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 the fraud in a gift card is much higher than the fraud in credit card or debit cards. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not untypical for a merchant to give discounts uh, to, to, this, to, the, to the distribution channels uh, of about, you know, 5-10%, uh, which is how they kind of pay for these, uh, you know, for these uh, costs, if you want. Uh, is by basically setting their gift card at a discount to the face value. So it goes, so you could go between anywhere between 20% to let's say 3%, right, as a discount. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift.io. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins, and they now support over 50 cryptocurrencies, which includes all the ones you have ever heard of, unless you have no life and spend way too much time on Bitcoin talk. So if you want to trade altcoins, there's the old way of doing it, which means creating an account somewhere, giving them all your data, uh, depositing your money, and then growing old while hoping for the best. Or there's a shapeshift way, which is fast, easy, and means getting it all done in less than a minute while not even needing an account. So here's something to consider. Shapeshift is a company that really stands by its values and goes out of its way to protect users' private data. One way they do this, obviously, is by not requiring you to give them any personal information to use a service since you can't even create an account to use it. And secondly, when BitLicense was enacted in US, Shapeshift was the first company to say, screw this, we're not standing for this nonsense. And what they immediately did was move the company out of the US and into Switzerland. So Shapeshift is a company that really believes in the core values and core ideals of Bitcoin. And we think that's very honorable and very cool. And, and plus, by sponsoring shows like ours, they really help entertain people like you and help promote growth in the industry. So good job, Shapeshift, for doing what's right. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So when you guys, or when you joined Gift or, or Gift, the company, so, so the thing Gift became well known for in the Bitcoin community was that they said, okay, we accept Bitcoin as a payment. You can buy uh, gift cards with Bitcoin, right? And at the time, there was very little you could do with Bitcoin. So, of course, a lot of people started using Gift. Now, we've talked a lot about the... Uh, the sort of infrastructure level problems were was gift at that time already trying to change some things there as well or was was sort of uh, the I guess the main difference between other gift card providers accepting Bitcoin um, no we really started were thinking about this uh, around yeah the beginning of the year um, so uh, so this gift, year yeah so gift you know, Gift is really committed to making it very easy, secure, instant to buy any gift card from any merchant. So, uh, uh, I mean, we we haven't really looked into adding other cryptocurrencies, uh, but uh, you know, if there was uh, a, a huge demand for that, uh, that's something that maybe we'd look into. Um, so we really started this thing, this this thought process. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the conversation around security, as, as I think it started a long time before uh, we started that, but uh, specifically working around and, 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 and developing something that would address that uh, study around the beginning of the year. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk uh, in, in just a minute about the work you have been doing to, to address this using the blockchain. 
But I thought it would be interesting to take a, a step back and, and take a, a sort of a bigger picture view on gift cards again. So the you mentioned Starbucks before, right? And that they do a quarter of their revenues with gift cards. Yeah. Of course, the interesting thing there, I guess, is that they're essentially like pre-financing. Uh, they're getting like free financing or how exact or how do you think about that? And and. How do you think about that also when you maybe go beyond Starbucks and think about merchants in general? What's the potential there? Well, um, I think the case for the, the Starbucks case is, is uh, you know, some people would say is a unicorn. I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to uh, replicate the, the combination of, uh, you know, you have a, a huge brand and you have a daily purchase activity uh, around this brand uh, at very low, uh, in very low amounts. So, and, and also you sell a drug, which is coffee. <laughs> so, uh, all these things make it very, uh, uh, unique, I think, to, uh, to replicate. I think it's, uh, if you compare to other companies, I mean, if, if Starbucks does about one fourth of their global revenue using, uh, using prepaid, about 10% using their app only, uh, it's it's quite uh, reasonable, I think, to expect that other businesses may be able to, depending on the kinds of products they sell, services they sell, to 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 do a lot more with with prepaid than they've done before. Uh, maybe in the range of five percent of their revenue, for instance. Um, so the Starbucks case is unique, but I think the reason why people haven't been really uh, using prepaid is just because of the uh, the fragility of the system. Uh, if you get something and you don't know how much money there is on it, if you don't know that you can trust it, if you don't know that uh, how much business is issued uh, uh, of it, uh, if you cannot easily uh, transfer it to someone else or resell it, it doesn't make it very attractive. Uh, but if it had all these capabilities, uh, I think a lot of people would be looking at it differently. Uh, and merchants would be uh, using it a lot more. There is a lot of benefits for merchants. So merchants, by using prepaid, they uh, generally they um, they get some cash up front, uh, which may or may not be uh, interesting to them. I suspect it's not for Starbucks, but uh, it may be for a small business, or I know it is. Um, I mean, crowdfunding and Kickstarter are a form of prepayment, right? Um, in in many cases. Uh, the other aspect is that you can reduce fraud, uh, so you can uh, and, and transaction costs. So you can ask people to pay, uh, you know, twenty-five, fifty dollars, hundred dollars, and then have a lot of small transactions, which is going to reduce your transaction fees. Uh, and also, you are building a relationship. Your prepayment, this asset that the customer holds, uh, becomes a point where you can, uh, you know, exchange or engage your customer around. So Starbucks, again, has been doing it with loyalty points. But just having a channel that you provide updates, people go to you to ask for their balance, or this becomes places where you can engage with your customers and you know promote offerings and stuff like that. So it's a very, uh, to me, it's a very, uh, very uh, interesting asset. It's just underutilized because of, I think, uh, uh, security and uh, just uh, user experience issues. And so the thing, the work you did with that other project, Credibles, we haven't talked about yet, but I, I think that is very interesting too, you know, because it, it sort of tried or tries uh, to roll out something similar to Starbucks, right? But, but make that accessible to small local merchants. Yeah. So the use case is, is very much, uh, and as I said, the use case is very, very much valid. So I think the, the challenge that You'll, you'll see from anyone doing anything related to local, including you know, the Yelp and the Foursquare and, and, and all Square or all these companies, uh, anything that relates to local and small business, is, is, it's all about having a very good distribution model. Uh, because it's all about, you're, you're essentially need, you need to reach uh, a population of small businesses that's very difficult to, uh, to reach. Uh, Small business owners are not always at their store. Uh, they have employees there. You cannot just stop by and try to have a conversation about Bitcoin. 
So I think uh, anyone who's been trying to sell Bitcoin to small businesses on the street knows that. Uh, and then uh, actually, uh, you know, getting them to sign up, to change their workflows, to train their employees, all of that takes a lot of time. And then uh, actually making sure that they stay in business because there's a lot of turn turnover in the small, small business community. So, uh, you know, all of that make your distribution cost huge. Uh, and there is an endless line, endless number of companies that have attempted to solve this problem. So if you're in the transaction business, it's even harder because they need to change their point of sale system. They need to upgrade it. They need to do uh, all kinds of things to it. So that is the main challenge, I think, for, uh, you know, how to change and how to make, uh, you know, these kinds of new blockchain based assets or cryptocurrencies available at these, at these merchants is who is going to fund the distribution cost and how do you recoup that uh, later on? So I think what was very attractive to me in uh, what uh, Gift was doing as part of First Data is that they uh, built a, an app for small businesses. Uh, it's called Gift for Business. And this app is, is available on a device uh, called Clover, uh, which is basically a... Uh, a POS device uh, running Android that is able to accept any kind of payment methods. But in addition, any developer can create a new app on it. And so they've built an app marketplace. So it becomes super easy for a developer to create a new app, deploy it to uh, a, an app marketplace, kind of like the iTunes store. And suddenly, for a small business owner who wants to try something new, they can just press a button and add it to their point of sale system, and it automatically becomes a new tender. So, to me, that's the future model of distribution to uh, of of new software to small businesses. For small businesses, the point of sale system is their central nervous system. This is their computer where they do everything. So uh, now that we have uh, smart devices that are able to become uh, a place where people, small business owners can try uh, different apps, uh, then it becomes much easier to start accepting other kinds of things, right? So uh, that was kind of what I thought was interesting with Gift and First Data compared to what I was doing before. Uh, I was doing this as a standalone app, uh, so, and a lot of companies do that. They, they build a new standalone app that they provide to small business owners. So now it changes the workflow. It makes it very expensive for the, for the business to participate. Whereas if it can be easily added to the point of sale system as a one click install, uh, that, that provides this, that solves the problem of how you scale to, you know, millions of businesses. Yeah, that's very interesting. And and just just a little bit of uh, background very briefly. So the Credibles, I guess the idea was, right, that with, you could basically do the prepaid with a local merchant, which then is, is sort of a little bit like crowdfunding, right? So you say like, okay, I really like this butcher. I'm, you know, I'm purchasing basically money there, sort of like buying in bulk, but I can actually use it over time. Yeah, so Credibles has been Credibles has been very successful with a few hundred businesses, and uh, you know many of these businesses have seen incredible results. So the the model has the model has has, has really uh, had really good response. The problem uh, was always like, how do we go from a few hundred to you know a few hundred thousand, uh, and you know that requires uh, a lot of capital to to build distribution. Uh, you know, companies like uh, Groupon as have hired, I mean, I don't know, I've heard thousands of salespeople to be able to do that. Uh, so it's not something that uh, companies are, or investors I think are very, you know, uh, uh, very uh, warm about uh, uh, to do. But I think the concept is is, is, is valid. I think uh, small businesses can look into, you know, leveraging the trust, the knowledge that their customers have in them to, uh, you know, get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more cash up front. Uh, you know, for small businesses to get 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 dollars up front from their customers, that is sometimes the difference between making it or not. So uh, the ability, the fact that they have now these 
tool that they can do it uh, is, is very useful. I think cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchain-based assets are going to make that much and much, much easier for, uh, for any kind of business of any size to do that. Today's magic word is gift, G-I-F-T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So we, we've went over the, the gift card industry and how it looks now, what the problems are. Can you talk to us about gift block and how you address all of these issues and make all that so much better with the blockchain? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple, I mean, there's a couple of things that I think are important. One is uh, the use of uh, uh, public infrastructure uh, at the core of every transaction and uh, use of a shared ledger uh, with uh, industry participants to, uh, to, to drive interoperability. So right now we're not really focused on uh, you know, making GiveBlock a uh, industry initiative. We are open to you know, and have conversations with other companies but we're primarily thinking of how do we improve the current infrastructure that we have at GIFT with this technology. So um, these, the, 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 the two main uh, interest was, uh, was to have a, a kind of a standard uh, uh, ledger uh, system that we could share, easily share internally within uh, other companies of first data as well as externally uh, with uh, with uh, you know partners and, and and third parties developers that want to uh, integrate with us. So initially, the you know when we started this thinking, we thought, okay, well let's let's build this on on Bitcoin. There was uh, there was already some people looking at you know private chains, uh, but we thought Bitcoin was going to be uh, probably the, the the best place to secure some of these assets. And uh, I think over time, we realized that uh, some of the scaling issues were going to take a longer time to be resolved. And so uh, we decided over the course of the summer to uh, switch to a, a private chain approach. So, uh, and uh, we still think that, you know, uh, GiveBlock as a private chain will, uh, in, will work with uh, Bitcoin, but as it is today, I think most of the assets that uh, we'll be issuing on GiveBlock will be issued on this uh, private chain. So, so from, a, from a technical perspective, how exactly does that work? Because is it just a fork of Bitcoin or, or do you use some other? Um... Yeah, so, so we're using uh, chain.com as our uh, blockchain provider. So I think they would be, uh, you should have them on the show to answer all these, uh, uh, all these technical questions. But uh, it's not really, it's not a fork of Bitcoin. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's, as close as, uh, it's as close to Bitcoin as it can be without uh, being a fork of it. That's, uh, that's where I'll, 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 I'll that's what, what I'll just say. I don't think, I think you, just should, you should just have them on the show to, uh, to answer the question. What we are very committed at, to is, is uh, is is making interoperability with Bitcoin very easy. So what I think is very important is uh, how do we take uh, how do we take for instance uh, an asset? How do we issue this asset on Bitcoin, uh, where uh, uh, and and then from there how do we move this asset to a private chain to do? Uh, small, tr quick, fast transactions that comply with uh, current regulations. Uh, and how does this private chain then uh, maybe checks into Bitcoin on a, every 10 minutes to uh, 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 provide a, a non repudiable sort of a, a, a timeline of, of transactions? I'm, I'm still curious though. So with private chains right i mean 
you don't have like mining pools and stuff. So uh, I presume you're going to have different, you know, different nodes that do the transaction processing. So uh, are these all, would these all be internal to first data or do you, do you try to set up a, a sort of a bigger network to get, I don't know, some of the companies issuing gift cards perhaps or, or third parties to also participate in, in this sort of s s process of securing the chain? If I can just chime in here, uh, uh, Gim, aren't you using Open Essence Protocol uh, as the layer on top of Bitcoin for issuing these gift cards? So that's why that's where we started. But uh, as I mentioned, we uh, we decided to move away from that over the course of the summer. So uh, I think there are still going to be use cases for using Open Assets on Bitcoin. Uh, I think, for instance, for uh, issuing an initial amount of uh, initial amount of asset. Uh, it's something that uh, I could see some businesses do on Bitcoin as a one-off, one-time transaction, and then move some of these Bitcoin to a, a, a private chain, effectively making the, 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 the private chain a, a side chain with uh, a much more, a much faster uh, settlement uh, mechanism, uh, and without having to implement, uh, you know, censorship around anti-censorship, right? as uh, some, some people would, would say. So on a private chain, there's, there's a number of rules that we need to, you know, uh, that we need to uh, uh, comply with in prepaid in terms of validity of transactions, uh, as well as uh, brands are very keen to understand where their assets are being used. So, for instance, if you're Disney, you don't want your gift card to be sold on the pawn site, right? So, uh, how you can maintain some of these things and monitor these activities is is important on a uh, for the gift card industry, right? Uh, to answer your question, what we want to do is we have this vision for uh, having uh, either a single chain or a, 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 a a network of chains of connected chains uh, that uh, you know the gift card industry players would be using, and so uh, we want to have these conversations. But initially, it's much more about just uh, us putting a product out there that's going to deliver a uh, much better experience and security for end users. Uh, so one thing that you know we were very much focused initially on solving this the security problem. But as we uh, as we started to implement things, what we what we realized is that um, the, uh, the 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 model of the the, the Bitcoin model of um, uh, of the redemption model, if you want, is is very interesting and can be used to provide a much better experience. So one thing that uh, we demoed uh, uh, a few months ago and also recently at Money 2020 is how we can do basically push payments, how push payments, which is how I describe Bitcoin payments, how these push payments can be used to do things that were not possible before and that other wallets uh, cannot do. So a good example is, for instance, doing uh, multi-asset payments. So uh, on a private chain that has you know support for an inf infinity number of assets it's very easy for uh, to kind of uh, have a slightly different version of bip 70 where uh, the merchant requests you an amount and in addition to this amount they provide you with a list of assets that they're willing to accept uh, it's very easy for the wallet to retrieve that in a machine readable format and then look at it and then build a uh, a transaction that's going to be uh, satisfying these requirements and push that uh, transactions to uh, to the blockchain. Uh, so effectively, what you can do is you can do a multi-asset transaction. So in one one payment, uh, one push, one click, you can redeem a gift card, uh, a payment with your bank deposit, your credit card account, your loyalty points, etc. Uh, whereas if you look at the current experience, even for what it's like you know, Apple Pay, you, you may have to go through each card uh, individually. So that, I think, is uh, 
you know, very valuable. I think people don't want to have to, to go through this hassle of selecting all these different cards. The other thing that's very interesting with uh, push payments and blockchain-based uh, payments is that the user is in control. Uh, I mean, the ethos of Bitcoin is that I own my assets, I do what I want with it, and uh, I don't have a bank. I sec- uh, they're secure by my... I can choose where I want to you know, secure them or deposit them, if you will. Uh, and when I pay, I decide what I send to the merchant. Or uh, So in, in this model of, of push payments and gift card assets, I, can, I may want to be able to review uh, on my wallet which, which asset do I want to use uh, where. Uh, and so I think that is, uh, that is very important because I don't see that, I think there is going to be a lot more assets uh, that people are going to be using on a daily basis. Uh, I think uh, right now we may, maybe we have five or ten assets in our wallet. Maybe we'll have you know fifty or hundred or more. Uh, so it's going to become very difficult uh, for you know providing an easy to use experience uh, on the point of sale system. So the point of sale system is going to have to become something much leaner that delegates much more of the uh, of the of the decision to the wallet, and the wallet is going to make a lot of intelligent decisions about uh, which asset I want to use, or do I want to swap an asset on the fly uh, with something else? Maybe sell one, buy one uh, to make a, a particular transaction. So, in, in terms of user experience and the security model that we can expect in this sort of new system, as as opposed to the the gift card 1.0 system. Um, if, if, for example, if I have a gift card on my phone and my phone gets stolen, is there any way for the merchant to be able to redeem that or perhaps invalidate my gift card? Like, What's the level of uh, control that the merchant has on these assets once they've been issued? Is it, is it like Bitcoin or is it something more like what we've talked about recently with Flavien Chalon uh, of uh, the open chain protocol, where essentially there's a validating you node know, that, that has control over what can, you know, what assets, or sorry, what uh, addresses can send uh, assets or not. Yeah, so I think it depends on, on the brand requirements. I think some brands will want to have very tight control over what can be done. And so you may, you, you probably want to enforce some of these things at the private chain level. Uh, with a, a signing node, uh, and you know, some others will be much more uh, free about uh, uh, what, how they want uh, their assets to to flow. So I don't think there is. Uh, I think some some rules are going to be enforced at the network level uh, on the compliance side. I think some rules are going to be enforced uh, at the wallet level. So the 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 idea of a private chain is also going to be able to, to maybe limit which which uh, which wallets are authorized to connect to it, um, and make sure that only certain wallets that have passed some compliance test are uh, accepted on it. Uh, so that with that mechanism, you could you could enforce uh, you know some rules to some, uh, for instance. Uh, I don't want my gift card to be sold uh, on this type of uh, marketplace. Uh, the way you're going to enforce this rule is, I think, much more likely to be done at the wallet level than at the at the network level. And regarding uh, so the the ability to exchange different gift card assets, um, so we we talked about this at the beginning of the show. Can you go into more details? So. What it, what it would look like if we'd have a uh, an exchange marketplace where you with your Starbucks uh, asset or your Starbucks money could change could uh, exchange it for like Walmart um, gift cards is is that something that would be desirable or even possible in this model Can you talk a bit about that Yeah so uh, I think from a end user standpoint it's very desirable to be able to take any, any gift card asset and sell it, right? And it's very desirable for someone else who wants to buy this gift card as a discount uh, 
to be able to buy it from them. Um, so there's value there. Um, I think the other side of that is that if you're, again, if you're, we're talking about brand money. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the brand, you may not want uh, to have your assets being freely traded uh, at major discounts uh, by, by people. So uh, I think uh, the way it works today is that um, um, the, you know, the brands provide access to their assets on certain conditions, right? That uh, resellers or exchanges or distributors are going to comply with some of the rules and are going to make sure that their resellers are going to comply with, with these rules as well. Uh, so I think I can see, a, a, you know, what it, what it's centric model, I can see that some of these things will be uh, preserved. Uh, uh, so I'm not expecting to have a free fall kind of space where people will trade any asset for any asset. Uh, I think it's much more likely to look like what exists today, uh, but uh, with uh, a much much higher level of, of security and and uh, understanding by the brands of where what's going on with their with their gift cards, right? So right now, for instance, on some exchange sites like um, um, I'm not going to give any names, but uh, I don't think the brands like that activity a lot uh, because they basically have their gift cards discounted um, and uh, people may buy gift cards from other people that may be uh, criminals and so when they go redeem it it doesn't work so i don't think that's very that's something that that brands want to promote but if the uh, if the transactions were secure maybe some of them will uh, change their mind. Um, it's 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 unclear right now what uh, to me what exactly is going to happen in the exchange uh, aspect of of gift cards. What I do think is that people when when we think about uh, putting assets like that on on a blockchain, the first thing that people think about is is exchange and trading. But there are much simpler use cases that I think are very interesting. Uh, if you think of uh, a merchant uh, uh, issuing, uh, uh, not a merchant, but a manufacturer of a, ser of a service or a product issuing, issuing uh, prepaid credits. Uh, typically, uh, this model has been limited to merchants that have their own retail location, right? So you buy a gift card or prepaid account from a, from a provider and then you redeem that for goods and services of that provider. But I think what Without talking about uh, trading and exchange, what what this uh, blockchain-based model is going to allow you to do is is to redeem these assets at other locations, right? That are not that are selling the products of the manufacturer, but are not part of the same company, right? So, example is uh, Starbucks uh, credits being accepted at other locations, or doing a Coca-Cola. Uh, cook dollars and having them accepted at uh, McDonald's, right? So Coca-Cola has millions of places in the world where their products are sold. But how do they uh, engage their customers, uh, you know, uh, around a prepayment account if uh, none of these locations are going to trust uh, the assets when they are presented to them? So I think having assets issued on on a on a blockchain means that uh, each merchant can now trust that uh, authenticate that they are receiving uh, uh, valid assets from this merchant, and then they can easily trade them back to the merchant for something else. So I don't think the trade the trading may not be something necessarily that's going to be look like a, a trading desk. But uh, the the I think there's going to be some a lot of these new scenarios enabled by blockchain-based assets where there is some trading involved.
Yeah, I think that's an exciting use case or the use case, which is like, let's say you have a bunch of organization that say, okay, well, we're too small to do uh, prepaid cards on our own. But, you know, if you get together and say we do like consortium and accept each other's things, then maybe that's something that can work too. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's where when I when I started working on brown bugs, this was kind of our idea is, is uh, if... Uh, is is as as a merchant, I I can issue some prepaid credits, but you know maybe they are not going to be trusted. So how can I pull them with other merchants into a, uh, a, a create a new asset out of a smart contract based on other merchants' prepaid credits, and then we have some rules in this smart contract. If any if any one of us fails, and that that asset uh, uh, if it's kind of like a, a derivative, right, uh, of a variety of assets as value to uh, may have more value to consumers because now they know they can use it at different places. Uh, they know that if one of us fails, they still can use it, right? So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen there, right? Uh, I think right now the most likely, the most promising scenario I see is just being able for a business to issue assets and having these assets to be used at a ton of different locations. Uh, I think to me, that's, that's the most exciting scenario. Let's take a short break and talk about Hide.me. Have you ever tried watching streaming TV from abroad? If you have, you've probably been greeted with an annoying error message written by some idiot lawyer telling you that you have no rights and you can't watch this program from outside the country. This used to happen to Sebastian all the time when he was in lonely France trying to watch his favorite moose hockey game in Canada. And you wouldn't believe how angry he got. That's where most of his gray hair comes from. With Hide.me, this painful phase of my life is now over. When I want to watch American television or my favorite moose hockey game from Europe, I just change my IP address and nobody ever knows where I came from. And with gigabit connections, I have zero lag. You can give Hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes, of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hi.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan, and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world, and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epson and Bitcoin. So, so as we mentioned in the beginning, you've been working in FinTech for a long time. And so I'm curious, at the time, what, what was the sort of the view insight the, the fintech, I assume that the sort of nascent fintech industry, did you guys have the expectation back then that, you know, this was going to like change the world in a uh, short time? As you know, today, right, we have that in the, in the Bitcoin blockchain space, there's this expectation like this will change and everything is going to come very fast. People will be, uh, will be thinking like, oh, what the hell happened here? How did I not see this coming? Uh, did you have a similar experience back then, or was was perspective different then? Yeah, so so I studied in fintech in two thousand four, and uh, mostly working with you know around uh, web services implementation. And I think there was a similar excitement at the time that you know web services were going to uh, you know change banking and change money. Uh, that finally banks were not were going to lose their power. People were going to be using uh, apps and uh, to connect to them, but banks would be basically a, a provider of a commodity service, right? Um, and um, you know, in terms of interoperability, interoperability, everybody thought, yeah, we're going to be able to more easily move money around, uh, trade different assets with each other. Uh, and from my standpoint, there was, I mean, not a, very little of that or none of that has happened. So 
Um, I think the the one thing that I mentioned sometimes is that's different this time with blockchain is that at the time there was uh, opportunities for people to do things uh, um, on their own and uh, not really look at uh, the true interoperability. So uh, some of these financial instruments can be complex, and unless you actually agree on a on the semantics, you really don't interoperate, right? So I think with with uh, with blockchain, we are forced to really uh, rethink the lower the lower part of the stack and at a very simple level of basically issuing an asset and transferring assets. Uh, and I think at that level, uh, because it's very, very simple, we're, we're gonna see a lot of interoperability. I think at the you know, smart contract level, maybe that's where we're gonna see a lot of uh, challenges uh, in uh, interoperating between different, uh, different assets. Uh, back, you know, ten years ago, we we could agree to disagree. I think right now, with blockchain, it's really about agreeing and consensus, and uh, automating reconciliation between different chains. So, um, uh, I, I see a lot more. I think I think we have a uh, there is a real chance uh, today. Now, uh, I know I you know I was at money. 2020 and there is recently there's a there's a lot of excitement about this but I think it's putting into question so much uh, when you think about it um, it's uh, I think there is a uh, one thing that I tell some startups is that it's it's uh, right now we've, we've seen some excitement uh, we've seen startups being very excited about Bitcoin and then as the price faded, a lot of companies said, oh, we're, we're doing blockchain now. Uh, and, and just focusing on really working with financial institutions. Uh, so there's a, a, a ton of companies that have emerged in the past year uh, doing that. Uh, the problem is that financial, financial institutions are, are extremely slow. Um, so I still see a lot of value in working uh, very closely with uh, around with startups trying to change the financial industry from the ground up, uh, because it's very difficult for uh, a, an existing player to put into question, you know, some of the things they've been doing for many years. Uh, so I think the right approach when you work with all these financial institutions is uh, to try to work on new projects. Right to try to work as a as if you are creating a startup from the inside. So instead of saying yeah let's let's move things to the blockchain, to really look at okay what are the new things that these these blockchain technology enables. So um, I'm not familiar with very familiar with Nasdaq, but what Nasdaq announced was uh, a private equity market, right? Which I don't know if this was something they were very much known for before. Maybe it's a brand new market for them. So they're not really uh, saying, yeah, we're going to use blockchain for moving all the existing uh, market activities that we have, which was built on systems over the past 30, 40 years. They are building something brand new. So um, uh, that's, I think that's something that we'll probably see happen uh, elsewhere. Um, it's much more likely for a new startup that's part of a, an existing financial institution. So I think it's more likely for a, a, a large bank to say, okay, let's set up a new, a new digital bank that's gonna be completely built on blockchain. Then to say, yeah, let's integrate blockchain into our existing systems. That would take a longer, much longer time to do. So, so talking about the, the blockchain topic or the Bitcoin topic, but let's say, um, well, actually, with both of them. So when you think of, first of all, of Bitcoin, where do you see this going? Where do you think it's going to have the biggest effect five years down the line? And, and similarly, where do you see the movement of blockchains and smart contracts, you know, in, try to attempt to integrate that sort of in the base layer of, of uh, our 
economic infrastructure, where do you see uh, those two uh, movements ending up? You're saying the Bitcoin movement and the blockchain movement? Right. So, I mean, I think there's, I, I don't, or maybe you see those as the same. I don't know. Um, they're certainly related, of course, technologically, and, and there's certainly a lot of interoperability that's possible, but I think they are trying to solve kind of different problems, at least the way I see it. I, I think fundamentally, when you do a financial, uh, like a ledger, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't mean a lot without actually, if your ledger is about being being uh, accurate and uh, resilient, etc., uh, doing that outside of any other ledger, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um, uh, you know, the way that companies and banks do reconciliation today is very manual. Uh, so I actually see, I, I think there's a a lot of the value of blockchain is how they're going to help us automate reconciliation between different different ledgers, uh, and it's it's not just for uh, financial uh, financial assets, right? Uh, applications for supply chain management, for instance, are are very interesting. So um, I really buy into this idea of an internet of chain uh, with potentially every company having a chain. And I think that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is going to play a key piece of that. I don't know if it's going to be a central piece, but I think it's going to be a, a major player in that uh, Internet of Change, if Internet of Change, if only because, um, you know, every chain may want to uh, commit to it uh, on a regular basis or because uh, it will become sort of the default uh, asset that you use to do, uh, you know, interchain uh, uh, trade trading, right? Um, that's so. Uh, to me, they, they are they are uh, related. The other aspect is that I think a lot of innovation came from Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of technological innovation came from Bitcoin. Uh, especially in the wallet space. Uh, and what's very exciting about Bitcoin to me is that it's it's the first time that we have a uh, an open source financial stack. Uh, and a lot of the innovation we see now outside in, in these three ledgers uh, is, is, uh, is been benefiting from that. So I... Uh, I, I, I think that we're going to continue seeing a lot of innovation on Bitcoin because of its permissionless aspect uh, that will be borrowed by private chain. I don't completely, uh, uh, I don't completely uh, put aside the possibility that after several years of uh, experimenting with blockchain and doing some very valuable work with blockchain that we, we may see a, 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 a revival as Bitcoin starts to scale or Ethereum starts to uh, scale that, you know, people will go back to a permissionless chain. I think there's a cultural, cultural change that needs to happen there. Uh, but um, yeah, in all cases, I, 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 I really see Bitcoin playing a central or public chain playing a central role in this uh, internet of chains. I mean, if you look at Ripple, for instance, Ripple was thought uh, originally as this idea that you could, you know, you could have a lot of different people issue different assets, and then you would have some kind of uh, protocol to do routing, and you'd be able to route any transaction from any node to any node. And when um, when the, the new repo, so this was the original repo before repo.com, uh, the new repo emerged and they created a currency as part of it to facilitate trade across, uh, uh, across nodes. So uh, maybe Bitcoin will play this role, meaning that if there is no liquidity available between uh, uh, two, two nodes, two chain on, on, on two different, on multiple different chains, maybe Bitcoin will be the default asset to to uh, execute the transaction. 
Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that that's definitely a possible scenario. And uh, that would certainly be a great outcome for Bitcoin. So, Guillaume, uh, thanks so much for coming on. It was very interesting talking to you. With one of the projects that's uh, best known in the Bitcoin space, you no know, gift. Many people love it a lot because, it, you know, it was sort of there when, when people wanted to spend Bitcoin. There wasn't much options, but actually also doing very interesting stuff. Uh, sort of thinking about how, you know, gift cards and prepaid and all can work better with, with Bitcoin. So thanks so much for sharing your perspective. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, thanks to our listener for joining us. So we are part of the LTB network. You can find all lots of great shows uh, about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies on letstalkbitcoin.com. And we put out new episodes of Epson and Bitcoin every Monday. And you can subscribe to those on iTunes, SoundCloud, of course, in your favorite podcast app or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbtc. And if you're a loyal listener, so we're still doing this uh, bribery contest. Basically, you just write a review, uh, let us know. So send an email to show at epicenterbitcoin.com and, you know, we'll, we'll sign you, send you a t-shirt. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.